We asked young Singaporeans of diverse backgrounds if you could ask MM Lee any question at all, no matter how weird or trivial or irreverent, what would it be? We came up with a list of almost 70 questions that gave us an insight into the issues that fire up young people, among them sexuality, gender, politics, disability and love. Do you feel that uh, women have attained equality in Singapore today? When you say equality, equality of what? Education, job opportunities, equality of uh, uh, arduous work? No, I mean, there are certain physical functions of the woman and it's different from a man. I mean, these are realities in the West, they're trying to they're trying to override these uh, differences and I think to their disadvantage. I mean, we recognize their different roles. Uh, women become mothers. Women have responsibility to bring up the children. Men will have to share part of that responsibility, but they're not women. They haven't born the child. So how about single mothers? We didn't receive some comments that single mothers felt left out by some government policies, say for um, CPF or HDB flats. So could there be more done to help? I am no longer in charge. I can only express a personal view. I think, I believe the way society has developed with the internet and travel abroad, we're going to have more single mothers. So you hold a more liberal view? No, I believe, not. I'm not more liberal or conservative. I believe in facing facts, facing trends, and this is a trend. You, you mentioned gay rights. Um, I was just wondering, do you think, what, what is your personal view on, on being gay? Do you think it's a lifestyle? No, it's not a lifestyle. You can uh, read the books you want, I mean, all the articles. You know that there's a genetic difference. So it's not a matter of choice. But they're born that way. And uh, that's that. I mean, so if two men or two women are that away, just leave them alone. Whether they should be given the rights of adoption is another matter because who is going to look after the child? That's, those are complications that arise once you recognize that you can actually legally marry and you say, I want to adopt. But as far as I'm concerned, I believe it's, you know, Vivian Balakrishna says it's not, uh, it's not decisively proven. Well, I believe it's in, there's enough evidence that some people are that way, just leave them be. This is more of a personal question, and if one of your, your grandchildren were to... That's life. They are born with that genetic code. That's that. Uh, Dick Cheney didn't like gays, but his daughter was born like that, so he says, I still love her, full stop. It's happened to his family, so on principle he's, he's against it, but it's his daughter, so you throw the daughter out. <laughs> That's life. I mean, none of my children are gay, but if they were, well, that's that. One of the questions we got addressed the issue of political apathy, and the person who asked this question um, claimed that it was partly the result of how political activism doesn't have a place in our university campuses. I mean, do you think this Let's is a... Let's go back to the history of it. Political activism meant the communists, right? And they were in charge of all the Chinese schools and Nanyang University. So we had to dampen the influence. We are now in a different stage. If we had 
difficult social, uh, educational, and employment conditions, we're going to have political activism all the time, as you have in Thailand, or now in Malaysia, or in Indonesia. Uh, the activism comes not from being, you know, discussing politics at uh, in your teenage years and uh, at university. What is it you're interested in? You're interested in getting knowledge and getting yourself useful. You have to have a certain amount of experience in life uh, to understand the difficulties people face, large groups of people face in life, and then you become an activist. I mean, I was not an activist in Raffles College or in Cambridge. I just listened, I watched, I learned. But when I, had, I came back and wanted to go into politics, I worked with the unions and I decided we have to do something about this. I mean, they're underpaid, no future, they're children. So I formed my ideas, uh, discussed it with my friends. Hence, we had the Women's Charter, full education in schools for everybody. And you were facing, we were facing real problems. I mean, not, not theoretical ideas about, you know, socialism or conservatism or state ownership or private enterprise. These are real problems. We had a small country. We have a small country. Uh, we need national service to defend the country. So the first thing that came to my mind is, unless they have a stake, why should they fight and die for Wee Cho Yaw's bank? or Lee Kong Chen's uh, sons and their homes and their shares. So I worked out the scheme, CPF, HDB flats, sold uh, below market price. You can't sell it for five years and we know that it will go up in value. So everybody now in Singapore has a stake. Do you think something is missing in today's young makers? Well, of course, I mean, what are you going to change in Singapore? I now I ask you, what do you want to change in Singapore, fundamentally? What they want is more growth, better homes, cars, more travel, better schools, better nurseries, uh, better kindergartens. That's it, they are fringe items. So the intensity of feeling for the for the country and, and its future? No, not the intensity of feeling for the country. You have now more to lose, therefore you've got to fight to keep what you have. But you cannot, there is nothing you can do which will fundamentally lift, up to another, lift us up to another plane. What can do that? Talent. Writers, thinkers, musicians, researchers, talented professionals who will attract more talent, and you become a lively city. That's not, uh, you cannot be done overnight, but we're heading in that direction. And uh, those who said this dull, sanitized society, absolutely nothing. They're wrong. We had first things first, we'd done it. Clean, green, law and order. Now we see our IRs, bar top dancing, uh, bungee jumping, reverse, whatever it is. If I can uh, put the question another way, why should a young person enter politics today? What, what is there to fight for? What matters? You've got to fight for what you have, right? If you lose what you have, and you become like the Philippines or Malaysia or Indonesia or Thailand, you've got a lot to lose, haven't you? To preserve what we have, we need talented, robust, committed people in charge. 
Look, we've been through a very serious crisis because we've built up reserves, because we've got thinking people. A thinking cabinet, a thinking prime minister, uh, finance minister, in Suisse, NTUC, they worked out the scheme. So, nine months into the crisis, there's no panic. Question now is, how long do we carry on with this crutch? Employers and trade unionists wanted to carry on forever, <laughs> but you can't. You got to, in the end, you got to restructure and reorganize your economy, right? The jobs that have gone away are not going to come back, so you've got to retrain. You do new jobs, and you've got to face up to it. So I get you're saying that you see no need to get youths interested in, in politics? They will get interested in politics the moment it hurts them. The moment the shoe pinches, they'll be jumping around. The unemployed, they'll get interested in politics very quickly. They'll vote for the party that says, I'll get you re-employed. Another question that came in was whether you believe in love and love at first sight. I don't believe in love at first sight. I think it's a grave mistake. <laughs> <laughs> You're attracted by physical characteristics and you'll regret it. Uh, I married a woman whom I knew for a long time. I had no interest in her when she was a student at Raffles College with me because I was too young and preoccupied with my work. But she told me later that she was interested in me. <laughs> so, but during the war, I was making gum mucilage, so Young Yukin was the chemist, so one production was my home, the other production was his home. And so I went to see, and there she was, and I said, oh, she's a... There was time on my hands. I was cycling, so I said, oh, she's a nice girl. So we became friends. And it gradually developed, and I carefully considered the problem. And uh, I think I made the right choice. And with every passing year, we adjusted to each other until now. Even our habits become the same. That's life. Your secret marriage in Stratford? She's an old-fashioned girl with an old-fashioned family, and so was mine. So we did not want to have an illicit liaison and it would be wrong, so we got married. But she was on scholarship, and my, my tutor would not have been very pleased to hear that I've got married. <laughs> so we just kept it quiet. So she wore the wedding ring on a, on a chain. The, all that I could afford was a, uh, was a platinum wedding ring. I think it was the right thing to do. But these days they say what? Well, I mean, I read, and then, was it your paper that reported that they did a poll on the teenage boys and girls now? More than 70% have already active sex by the, way, by the time they're 14, 15. Or whatever it was. I, mean, I don't think that's a good idea. I would be very sorry to see my grandchildren or my granddaughter do that. No, I mean, after a while it becomes just a physical commodity, that's all. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, another question was, uh, who is your favorite child and grandchild? I can't answer that question. All of them are favorites. But I would say the most uh, likable fellow is my, is my disadvantaged uh, grandson. Uh, he's turned out very polite, well-spoken, well-behaved. Uh, quite unexpectedly, because I used to take him around 
his mother died within a month of his birth. So my wife and I used to take him walking around the Astana at night. And we were very worried because he did strange things. When we changed the route, he would cry and knock his head against the ground. So I said, something's wrong with this boy. And my daughter said, She's, he's autistic. So people with autism do not like to change habits, food or whatever it is. He's much improved now. And she's, over the years, she watched him develop, said, no, he's got mild autism called Asperger's. That's fortunate for him and for the mother and father. But he's a nice lad, speaks very politely. You have mentioned before that uh, you had dyslexia. Yeah. Um, so I didn't know that. Yeah, but how, how did you find out later? Well, that my daughter brought a dyslexia specialist. He was in Singapore for some conference, and she knew she had dyslexia, but in a stronger form than mine. So she's seen some of my spelling mistakes. So she suspected that I've got dyslexia. So he brought him to see me in the office. And he put me several questions, asked me to spell out certain words. So he says, you've got mild dyslexia. But I went through life, I, would, uh, I think I was already 50 plus or 60. I overcame it. I should have come to that conclusion that something was wrong when I did a course in speed reading. And I did not succeed. And it's not because I'm stupid. Because I usually have to r run my eye back to make sure that I got the right word. So that slows me down. But because I read more slowly, it's, I read only, only once and it sticks. So there are compensations. The important thing is not to be discouraged and feel I'm disabled, no. Leonardo da Vinci was dyslexic, so what? He was a great artist, sculptor, thinker. So. I'm not comparing myself to him, but if he can overcome dyslexia, fortunately I overcame it without my knowing it. <laughs> it was, yeah. How do you think today's youths uh, perceive you? I don't know. I, my grandchildren probably think I'm too strict. <laughs> do you think they, they sort of look at you as some kind of... Uh, Mythological figure, even. You know. No, I don't. I'm not a mythological figure. I don't know what they think of me or what. Or not. Uh, in any way, it's not relevant. I'm no longer a central player in politics. But you mentioned, um, you know, some several statesmen that you really admire. Do you think? Do you hope to be remembered in the same way as them by by Singaporean youth? No, I'm not. First of all, I do not classify myself as a statesman. I put myself down as a determined, uh, consistent, persistent trial. I set out to do something, I keep on chasing it until it succeeds. That's all. That's how I perceive myself. Not as a statesman, it's utter rubbish. Anybody who thinks he's a, he's a statesman needs to see a psychiatrist. psychiatrist. I like this question, do you believe in feng shui and astrology? Because I think a lot of Singaporeans suspect that you do. Utter rubbish. Utter rubbish. Look, I'm a pra pragmatic, practical fellow. I do not believe in horoscopes. I do not believe in feng shui, but 
And I don't, I'm not superstitious about numbers, but if you have a house which other people think is uh, disadvantaged feng shui in numbers, and when you buy it, you must consider that when you resell. So again, it's a practical consideration, not that I'm interested in it, but if I buy that, I must get a low price because when I sell it, I will get a low price. Do you believe I, <laughs> I go for feng shui and horoscopes? Well, you know, there are all these stories about how our $1 coin has got eight sides to it because you, know, you thought that it was a good idea and it was auspicious. And <laughs> you know, People spin these yarns and let them die. <laughs> it doesn't bother me. Um, is there... Is there anything that um, you think you need forgiveness for? That's one question that came in. There's another part of game question. I did what I thought was right, given the circumstances, given my knowledge at the time, given my the pressures on me at the time, that's finished, done. I move forward. You keep on hucking back, you're just wasting time. Do I regret going to Malaysia? No. It was the right thing to do. Did it fail? Yes. Do I regret pressing for Malaysian Malaysia and making it fail? No. If I did not, we'd be stuck. And today the same issue is there. So it's part of a process of just growing up. And you once said you would rather be feared as a leader than loved. Yeah, of course. If you're not feared, when you say something, people don't, they won't take notice. But they know that when I say something, I mean it. And if you, if you're gonna cross swords with me, then you must be willing to get stabbed. That's that. If I think this is going to be, it's necessary to do, and you set out to thwart me, then we fight. So to avoid a fight, I make quite sure that you understand that I will fight. Simple as that. I am not interested in being loved. What's the profit in it? But this this climate of fear, I mean, it's, it's part of it is your creation because of the uh, way. Come off it. Are you fearful? If you are not fear, if you are fearful, why do you ask me these questions? Is anything going to happen to you? Utter rubbish. We may not personally be fearful, but we did encounter quite a few young people who were... I cannot explain that. And I'm not interested in whether they are fearful or not fearful. I think it's better that they are fearful <laughs> and will take me seriously that they think I'm uh, some, somebody they can brush off. That's all. And if you're the Prime Minister and you're brushed off, you're in trouble. One impression that we got um, serving young people is that they're starting to see you as a kind of celebrity. So do, you, do you worry? No, no. I'm, what they think of me does not worry me. I'm no longer in active politics. I don't have to collect votes. I don't have to be popular. All I do is to make the right decisions, use my uh, network around the world to improve our chances, that's all. Uh, these things do not concern me. It's irrelevant to me what they think of me. What they think of me after I'm dead and gone in one generation will be determined by researchers who will do PhDs on me. Right? So there'll be lots of Revisionism. As people revise Stalin, Brezhnev, and one day, now Yeltsin, and now later on Putin. I mean, I lived long enough to know that you may be idealized in life and reviled after you're dead. What are the things important to me in my life? 
my family and my country. My family, my wife looks after. She brought up the children. But Singapore is an ever-going concern. Uh, Singapore is my, my concern till the end of my life. That's that.